Okay, we are moving into project initiation. Um, and we have Mike Darling and Omar Ahmed. Um, Mike Darling is definitely, he's a charter member of the yes, Say Yes to Diane when she reaches out to you about training. He says yes. He's, he's also said yes to other things that I have needed, taking the time to help me out with one of my first, actually my first project in the project management office. So Mike, thank you so much. Um, so Mike is a Region 4 Senior Transportation Project ma Manager. He's done it all, and he's a professional. And added now to the club, Omar, if you knew it or not, because he's doing double duty to, um, later on today. Um, Omar is a Region 4 Resident Engineer Consultant Projects. And uh, he agreed kind of late in the process to come present, and so I really appreciate it. So gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Diane. Uh, my name is Mike Darling, and Senior Transportation Project Manager in Ben. I've been with ODOT for about 17 years, uh, about a decade of that as um, managing projects, as project leader, transportation project manager, whatever you want to call it. I'm just going to call it project manager. So I've been doing that for about a decade. Before ODOT, I worked for two different consulting companies and did environmental project management, bulk fuel plants, chemical plants, pipelines, things like that. Um, so I started with ODOT in 2002, and I'm still with them. And I'm going to tell a little story after Omar introduces himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Omar Ahmed. Um, thanks for the <coughs> intro. Um, I've been with ODOT since January. It's not very long, but I have a lot of fun projects that I've been working on since I've been here. Um, before this, I was at Virginia Department of Transportation for almost nine years. So we're going to give a high-level uh, perspective of project initiation. Uh, we're going to kind of go high level, and it, but at points we are going to dive deep, and then come back up and dive, dive deep. Um, we're fortunate to have some uh, slides that were added to our presentation to help us kind of capture those recent changes in PDII. Um, a big thing we're going to focus on is the why and the what, and a little bit of the why I want to tell a little story. Since uh, Bill told a story, I get to tell a story too. So uh, the, t the time is the middle 1600s, and this is a story about bricklayers and and cathedrals, you may have heard this. This is the real story, this is the background to it. Um, the time is the middle 1600s. Uh, it's the time of the plague. 10,000 people a year were dying in England a year of the plague. Um, the port sanitation was poor, conditions were horrible. In September 1666, a fire started at a bakery. Four days later, 60,000 of the, 60, the 70,000 homes in London were destroyed. In addition to the homes being destroyed and unknown countless people who died, St. Paul's Cathedral burned to the ground. A, uh, a famous architect of the time, his name was Sir Christopher Wren, was tasked to rebuild this cathedral. And so he set, set in motion the work and effort to do that. In 1671, he uh, went out to do an inspection of the work, and he noticed there were three bricklayers, three workers on scaffolds working on this, on this wall. And he asked one of, the, one of the workers, what are you doing? And the bricklayer said, I'm a bricklayer, I'm laying bricks. Oh. And he asked the second person on the, on the wall, on the, on the scaffold, what are you doing? And the person said, I'm building a wall. Can't you see? I'm building a wall. He asked the third person, who was also laying bricks, but seemed to be a little more productive, a little more interested in what he was doing. And he asked that person, asked that bricklayer what he was doing. And he said, I'm building a cathedral to the Almighty. Now, what's the point of that story? They're all doing the same thing. They're all laying bricks. One person got the why. Big part of what you're going to be facing as project managers is you're going to have a lot of bricklayers working on your projects. It's your job to manage and to impart the vision of the why. The business case does a little bit of that, but you have to really think about why you're doing what you're doing. You're just not pouring asphalt, building a roundabout. You're solving problems. You're solving complex transportation problems. And you're building things that can outlast your own lifetime. And to be part of that is a privilege. So the why. I'm going to kind of talk about that as we kind of go through this, about the project initiation, 
because you can kind of get sucked into laying the bricks. Take a step back and remember why and, and to impart that vision to you and your team. All right. Whoops. So the project system lifecycle where we're at, project initiation, we did scoping, everything is scoped. And why is that important? Has anyone heard of the draft 2124 STIP? Okay, yeah, someone's heard of it. So we're getting ready, it's gonna be ready to go to the OTC, to get acted on. They're already talking about advancing uh, PE phases early. So a lot of the folks in this room are gonna be, have the fortunate ability to initiate projects under the new uh, PDII uh, uh, deliverables and with the new system. So this is pretty important. You're gonna be delivering projects in the 2124 step really soon. And the odds are you didn't scope the project, you don't have the information, and the only thing you might know about the project is the name, okay? So we'll talk about that. So, I can't remember if it, yep. So scoping and project initiation can take years, okay? I have, uh, I, I initiated a project, kicked off a project um, that actually we did the scoping back in 2014. And I've also been working on projects that I get them and I'm like, oh, there's the name, but I don't have any information about it. Kind of the same story you heard about, right? So there's a lot of things that can change in the time that the project was scoped and the project gets to you and assigned to you. What did I forget? Oh. Yep. So as you begin, what's your role? What's the responsibilities? Deliverables, challenges, risks? What are the impacts of scope, schedule, budget? The kind of discussion we had before. Oh, I got this thing, I'm kicking it off, I'm getting it rolling. Uh, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough this, I don't have enough time. Okay, that, you can identify that early on. So before you really begin, as you start to turn the flywheel, that's the way I look at it, is project initiation. You've got this flywheel and you're starting to turn it to get it moving. Ask yourself these questions. So as Mike was saying, there, there could be years between when a project was scoped and when you actually initiate that project. And oftentimes there's quite a few changes. Um, so it's important that during that time we're able to gather those changes, um, understand why they're made, and include them the best we can. Uh, we don't always have um, all the tools or maybe all the resources that we need to do that, but we need to do the best we can. Um, and so this is our, you know, our project, it's really our project initiation process. The reason that we put outsource in front of it is because um, up top you're going to see this orange arrow. It's a little hard to see, but that's your procurement timeline. Um, there's a link to this that actually goes into the steps of that. Um, but what we want to stress here is that procurement timeline does take time. That could be 30 days, it could be six months, it could be a year. Um, and so it's something you really need to consider. It's something that you probably won't have a lot of control over either. Um, so the recommendation that I would have for you is to make sure that you're best friends with your OPO rep in your region. Um, and if you don't know who they are, find out. Um, they're going to be able to tell you what their workload's like, what's happening with the industry right now, and maybe um, negotiations aren't going well because labor rates are higher than they've ever been. Um, you know, those, those are the sorts of things that are going to add time uh, to this process. We're going to actually get into these steps a little too. Yep. So some of the project initiation steps overview, open a PEA, and uh, you can actually open an early EA. Shh, don't tell anyone, right? You can actually... Get that going early and start doing some work. Just don't tell anyone the EA. You can open your PEAA, develop a project schedule, baselining. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Charter, validate that, finalize the project scope, schedule, risk. Zero CMR, we're going to uh, touch on that uh, briefly here. Assign resources. Uh, this is when you get to send out emails and talk to the unit managers in the tech center or um, identify your consultant and assign resources to the project. Uh, consultant contract is needed, IGA is needed. Sometimes you need an IGA to get going before you get your IEA, your EA, sometimes you don't. And a pre-kickoff. Now why do you think you might need a pre-kickoff? A pre-kickoff kickoff is what I call it. So. so I found this to be a useful tool early in the project initiation process. It's not formalized in here, but it's something I personally like doing especially the complicated projects that are uh, urban and have a lot of pieces moving on. 
is after I got my EEA, I called together two or three people who actually maybe were involved in the scoping, if they're still around, <laughs> if they're still around two, three years later, um, and try to understand what about this project that I don't know, it's not written down, that I can, again, you know, do a brain suck, get, get from their mind. The other part is, to, as we'll see in a minute, I can get some other things rolling, survey and API and, and the Opal and those kind of things. Again, get that flywheel turning. Another note on pre-kickoff, this is a really good opportunity to get everybody on the same page about what the project is and why. Uh, gathering information is a key part of that, but it's really important that your um, assigned resources start to understand the point of the project, the intent, the goals, um, especially when you're putting together a statement of work for a consultant or outsourced project. Um, we, you know, we all have different backgrounds, so I know, for example, for me, I need to rely heavily on our traffic group to help explain you're gonna need this, this, and this, and this is what your statement of work should include. Um, you know, certain touch points for them. This is an opportunity to get your internal resources on board for that. Um, and, a, and a slide about uh, your open your PE, EA. Again, coordinate with your STIP coordinator. And again, why maybe you wanna get that EA opened early, uh, earlier than maybe is in the schedule. Is any of the work, maybe you need to refine that scope, maybe you need to dig down a little deeper, that should be charged to that project EA, right? Um, and as you need it, you may have to have an IGA completed prior to the EA. Project-wise. So, um, <clears throat> at pretty much every, at this point, I believe every uh, project that gets initiated in project-wise should be on the unified structure. Um, really all that means is that in the past, uh, if you've had an outsourced project, consultants will have their own folder subset. Um, this is all just one big group, so we're working from the same documents. Um, they're able to access and see things as well. Um, this is also key as, as well for the in new initiation process and new DAP process, which we'll talk about in a later presentation. Um, and we'll get to those steps later too. But this is a, a place to kind of compile documents for the project controls office to understand when they needed to get started. Okay. So develop the project schedule. Uh, we in Region 4 developed draft project schedules for all our uh, scoping projects and we've uploaded them to the STIP folders and that's a great place to start and one of the reasons we've done that is we're forecasting and looking out to construction years to make sure we're not piling up uh, four PSEs over two months and, and then the next year there's nothing for construction to do, right? If you've got some ability to control some things, why not win? Why not set some things up to win? So we've already created uh, draft MS project schedules, created those and put them in the uh, STIP folders. Uh, this is an opportunity to review that that schedule and make sure it correlates with um, your, in, your intention on the project, what you know about the project. Uh, you're gonna need to acquire, make sure you have required all the 10, um, required uh, 10 milestones, uh, baseline to schedule, uh, the bid let date. This is when you need to uh, discuss with PCO, with Michelle Gauthier about your uh, your bid let date, which is forecasted, and again, this is still project initiation, right? You haven't even had the project kickoff meeting, but you need to identify that uh, bid let date, work back from there, make sure, make sure your schedule is aligned with that. Um, coordinate with your, ac your area manager about the percentage of the in-house and out, uh, outsourcing decision. And there's again the link to MS project training materials. This is really important too in that, um, again, for outsourced projects, uh, the consult community has to rely on reports that we automate and post on our external website. Um, and that pulls a lot of the, their dates and timelines from this schedule. So um, the consult community needs time. They need to understand when projects are happening and uh, plan for that, with, whether it's with their resources and how they're going to put together a proposal package and stuff like that. Um, so it's really important that these are as accurate as we can get them and that you've worked with your area manager to you know, figure out what disciplines need to be outsourced and the tech center units as well. Um, really, and just give the consultant community the, the biggest heads up you can give them. Um, the, the more bids you have, the better process you're gonna have and the better you know, opportunity and talent you're gonna get. So it's really important that you get more bids on your project and the only way you're gonna do that is by letting them know sooner. And to be able to communicate that and, and I got a, a good, good story about that. So I have a project in Prineville on US 26 and uh, it's actually uh, um, House Bill 2017 is adding $3 million to the project. So we're gonna be able to do something unique and um, to, to downtown Prineville that it sorely needs. Um, it, was on the, it was on the schedule and uh, we actually had a number of consultants ask about 
this project because we're going to do full service any contract. And you know, before I started working on it, I could talk about it, right? So, but once I start working on the RFP, I can't talk about it anymore. So I encouraged them to come and uh, talk to me, and I had several consultants come and visit, you know, and actually talk to me about the project. I could show them the map, I could show them everything that I knew to get the interest going. So that can work in your favors to get. Uh, to make sure you get a number of uh, consultants interested in your project, get that information early out, and make sure it's accurate. That's the other part, too. So it's, again, important to have the schedules and have them accurate and have them uploaded. Project charter. <clears throat> so, again, we did a draft charter in our scope, in our, uh, for our scoping. Now's the time to finalize it. Okay. And, again, this is a lot of the, the what and the how and the where, where the money's coming from. This is that opportunity to nail those things down. Right. Um, um, capture changes in the zero CMR. Uh, does do you need a stip moment to uh, reconcile the differences? Remember that time that's gone by between the time the project was scoped to now you're initiating the project, what has changed? Um, one of the things, and we'll talk about that again in a little bit, is ADA requirements have changed. Uh, I'm working on projects now that were scoped in the last stip cycle, right? And it, you know, we, we basically estimate a $5,000 a ramp. Well, that's not enough. That, I mean, that's total everything, right? That's not enough. So that world change. Um, so identify those things that you may need to adjust and you may need to do a step amendment. Milestone dates in the schedule table must be the same as the dates in this project schedule. Right, Emerald? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Emerald uh, went through this uh, process with, uh, with ADAPT. And that's something to remember too. Everything's got to correlate. Everything's got to be able to uh, talk to one another and be and be uh, uh, and be the same. What else? Okay. Digital signatures. Again, we <coughs> talked about this a little before. <coughs> Excuse me. You've seen this already. Uh, one of the great news is that the we don't have to flatten PDFs anymore that you should be able to take the existing PDFs that are fillable and still add your uh, DocuSign uh, digital signature to it. Um, as someone who had to work with fax signatures before in my large, this is the, the great new world. So I love project-wise and digital signatures. Change management request database. Um, so all CMRs should be entered into this database. And we know it's clunky. It's access. It's hard, I know. Um, it is what it is, right? There's, uh, there, and everyone realizes that. It's just, you know, it gets us to the place where we can start doing that reporting and start tracking these things. So there's a reason for having to do it. Now, you can still do your own internal process. Region 4, we actually have a spreadsheet uh, that, we, that we actually do our, our CMRs on, right, for our, our region use. But ultimately, you need to fill out the, the online database to track these things. And a single CMR can uh, capture up the three changes. So, and I just kind of wanted to drive home the importance of this. Again, like Mike said, it's really kind of rough right now, but it'll get better. Um, but, you know, this is one of the first steps <coughs> to start collecting the data that we as a state should be collecting. Um, as, as David Kim mentioned earlier, we are data rich, but we can always do better. Um, and this is a way to start becoming more proactive about changes and start learning what projects, you know, always see the same types of changes and start fixing those on the front end rather than being reactive and fixing them on the back end. Uh, the changes get a lot more expensive as the project progresses. So the sooner we know about them, the better. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to start collecting that data more holistically and analyzing across the state. CMR, uh, future uh, changes. After you uh, do the zero CMR, if there's any future CMRs, there's only three uh, change categories. Avoidable, unanticipated, and elective. Um, so elective, good business decision, right thing to do. Um, I've got a good example of that. So I have a project, US-20 Empire in Greenwood. Um, it incorporated, it, it was a rather complex project, a lot of pieces in downtown Bend, traffic signals and right away, and I mean, you know, the right away budget was two million, UR is a million, I mean, there's just a lot of moving pieces. Uh, the city decided to step in and contributed a million and a half dollars to completion of sidewalk and sidewalk infilling filling on a portion in Greenwood. Well, we couldn't do that um, and deliver a project in 2020. Their funding wouldn't be available till later. So what we did is broke the project up in essentially three pieces. And the northern piece, actually Omar's inheriting that uh, work on Empire, 
but the work we're doing on third, work we're doing on Greenwood, we're breaking up. So that became a good business decision, right? There's, there's a, it's the right thing to do. So that's a, a clear case of that. Uh, unanticipated, um, that's one of those things where you do your best guess and, and you're like, well, we didn't catch it. You know, things, the world changes. Again, three years, four years go by since you scoped and now you're working on the project, things have changed. ADA is one of those, one of those big things. Uh, I've had that on a number of projects, we all have. If you have active projects, it's, it's, it is what it is. But how, where does that come from then? Both the time, the money, do you have to hire a consultant to do it? We, we can't, we, we're overwhelmed, I mean, we have yeah, reason for, so we don't have the capacity to do all these ADA ramps. We've had to consult all that work. Well, that's consultant contracts, right? Who does that? And that costs money. So again, these are the things, you know, unanticipated. Uh, avoidable, we missed it, we own it. That's a tough one. No, it's red for a reason, I guess, or orange up there. Um, I was tough, I, I was trying, we were trying to think of one, and uh, uh, one that I could think of is uh, an early experience in Region 4 when we uh, did the Redmond reroute project, which we routed US 97 out of downtown Redmond uh, to the east. And essentially we went through uh, an old, uh, well we went through a current, a, a, a electrical distribution facility, went through uh, junkyards, former bulk fuel plants, existing bulk fuel plants, I mean just right through the industrial area, right next to the railroad. Well, that cost a million dollars alone right in hazmat cleanup. That wasn't anticipated, that wasn't acknowledged. That's the sort of thing that we can miss if we don't do a, a if we don't really nail down the things in scoping and understand. So any, uh, I know we're kind of running through this. Is any, uh, any uh, stories, any, any uh, like anticipated, unanticipated, any, any thoughts on that? Oh, Any thoughts? Yeah. Any yeah. stories? Anything yeah. you want to share? Nope. Okay, good. Everyone's in the green then, right? So good. All right. All right. Project initiation steps. Okay, to kind of continue. So environmental requirements, area of potential impact, uh, initiate access management process. Uh, so I've already been asked this. What, are you going to get the API already? You don't even kick the project off. I said, yes, because I want to get the survey going. I want to, so that's again why I do kind of a pre-kickoff kickoff myself, is I get two, three people in a room, find out what this project really is, have Roadway submit the survey request, and start the survey. If you're doing a consultant contract, it's going to be four to six months right, before you can issue that NTP for a full service contract. Meanwhile, you can have survey get in the DTM, so when, the, when you issue the NTP to your consultant, you've got the DP, DTM ready to go, you can give that to them, you're ready to go. Okay. So again, there's things that run in parallel. You don't have to wait, things are not sequential. What can you do? What can you get going? Uh, the OPAL. Um, access management is another one of those things that can get you into the red, right? And it, we, didn't, we missed it, we, we didn't catch it. Um, get, get going early on, um, on access management like OPAL. You can get the OPAL rolling, uh, especially if you've got an urban project with a lot of approaches. I have, again, that same project, US 20 Greenwood Empire, we had 171 approaches. Every single one of them we had to make a decision about. Well, we had to start early and get that OPAL going. So what can you get going early? What can you initiate? Relocations, if you know you're gonna have right away, um, well, you can have right away, but right away relocations, that's gonna add a lot of time to your project. Make sure you've incorporated that. Especially with the new stage gates. Um, yes. We all know that you know, with the new DAP stage gate, it's kind of been pushed out. Uh, it absorbs more work. And that, that's affecting our project deadlines as far as right of way is concerned. So anything you can do to get right of way started even a little bit sooner is super critical to the completion of your project on time, especially if it's already in flight when the new stage gates hit. Yep. And communication, um, uh, I don't know why that's not here even though I made this slide. Um, the communication plan, start that outreach, work with your local stakeholders, who do we need to start talking to, who do we need to get us in front of, get in front of city council, explain, hey, there's this project, we're just starting it, we're just getting going, you're gonna hear more about it, we're coming back in six months, we're coming back in a year, but get, get, get the word out, get things rolling, okay? Mike, Mike we had a question over there. Oh. No, I've got an EA. No. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's another reason to get an EA if you have to get it early. Is to, again, it's there's things that 
are going to take time, and if you don't get them going early enough, they're going to impact um, things like right away and access management, which it will impact your DAP. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Exactly. Like I said, I keep it very small. I don't. Not. I don't get it out. I just. It's. I, you know. Some core folks. Okay. We, we want to get some things rolling here, like access management stuff. We want to get the survey going. Um, you know, who who's the key players so we can start identifying as, the, as, I, as I as I'm developing the scope of work uh, for the consultant. Who do I need to access to help me write that? Right? That's the kind of sort of thing. So. Um, again, those steps, project-wise, third-party access. So just on that note, um, yep. again, yep. for an outsourced project, you're going to need to request access for your consultants, which you probably won't have at this point. Um, but it's important to know that you're, if they haven't been in project-wise or if they're not already on project-wise, they have a host of forms that they need to fill out. Uh, Pete and Priscilla are really good at helping you with that. There's a whole team that's really quick to respond. Um, so if, as soon as you know who your, who your team's going to be, get that started, because you don't want that to be a hold up. Yep. So again, uh, identify your project stakeholders, which I've just talked about with your uh, communication plan. Initiate your survey, be, base map your DTM. Uh, those are good things to have initiated and get done. Uh, baseline the schedule with the project controls office. Project kickoff meeting. That's when you start getting everyone in the room and, you, and you've already issued the NTP to your consultant. They're sitting at the table. Your core folks and your team are sitting at the table and that's when you can actually kick off the project. And that's a good opportunity also for the why. Again, your room's gonna be full of bricklayers. That's when you gotta have that vision, understand why you're there. Because it'll start immediately. Well, we need to fix this, we need to do that. It's, you know, well, we can't do this and this thing, right? Focus on the vision. That's your job as the project manager to get that project to construction. And this is, this is, a lot, this is that opportunity for you to set the pace and to, and to set the expectations for your project team. Um, and then only then, after all these things are done, is, is the project phase, region phase gate complete. Um, just some tools. Just, uh, this, is, we, this isn't kind of formal of any part of the PDIA process. This is some, some things that we found is helpful. <clears throat> is OneNote as a huge tool that we found to be able to collaborate and share with one another as project managers um, as we go through the process. We use it in our own projects. I keep notes that way. We also use it to communicate and, and has a re repository of links and videos. I mean, uh, um, we, we've had our STIP coordinator generate some amazing uh, videos for us on how to do things, and we just embed the links in, into OneNote. And, we have a whole uh, folder system set up that allows us to communicate those things. For, for OneNote as well, um, you know, for, so we have it set up for our PLs to use as a group, but um, to kind of hammer that home, every meeting that anyone sees me in, I'll have my laptop open yep. and I'm yep. keeping notes on OneNote. Yep. Um, I cannot stress the importance of documentation, yep. um, importance of documentation. Uh, it's hard to take notes when you're running a meeting, but figure it out, do it anyway. Um, small story for this one. My very first project uh, when I started in construction management actually um, ended up getting, a, there's a subpoena on the project between two different petroleum pipeline companies. Um, it was pretty heated. It cost uh, the locality close to a million dollars and uh, it was because one of the pipelines were leaking. We didn't know who, but there was jet fuel on the ground. It wasn't from us. Um, so long and short of it is, if it wasn't for meticulous note taking, which at the time I wasn't great at, um, we would have been owning some of this liability. Uh, it's, it's not something that we, anyone would have seen coming, anyone would have expected to happen, but the fact that folks in our team were taking really, really meticulous notes saved us. Um, so I guess the point of that is you don't know when that's gonna happen, you don't know um, if things are gonna go sideways, but if you documented and kept notes, you can always go back to it. The nice thing about OneNote, at the time I was doing it on paper, so it was awful, but the nice thing about OneNote is it's searchable, so it'll, Whatever you write, you can just type it in the corner and it'll look through all your binders, all your folders and find it for you. So I really, really strongly suggest keeping good notes. Great, thank you. Um, budget spreadsheet, again, these are sort of things you wanna set up for yourself as the project manager as you're initiating the project. Set yourself up a budget, uh, budget spreadsheet, start tracking the budget of both the consultant and of your team. Um, 
bookmark your work order contract. There'll be a work order contract. If you've got a consultant on board, make sure you know where that is. Um, invoice tracking. Uh, there's different tools, different spreadsheets. Uh, we've, got, we've been fortunate enough to, we have someone in our office that actually has taken that over. Um, Helen, and uh, it, it's an amazing job of tracking those invoices they come in, verifying them with compliance and all that. Uh, but again, for you, the project manager, you're still ultimately responsible for the budget. So now's a good time to set up that budget spreadsheet. Yes? Yes, yes, that's, a, yeah, what I've heard before with consultants, time and materials not to exceed, with ODOT staff, time and materials to exceed, right? So um, that's a tough one. There's no answer. I, you know, it's, it is what it is. Uh, that's one of the things, like I said very early on, get an EA, you want to be careful about who you share that with. Um, I also have expectations that if you're going to be working and billing on the project, you're going to be generating someone, something. Um, it frustrates me no end when people spend a lot of time on a project and where's plan sheets, where's something, what are you doing, right? So it, it, there is no answer, I'm sorry, I don't have one. Uh, well, it's also really important to make sure that your area manager or, and you yep, and your yep. tech center unit managers are communicate, communicating regularly. Um, so you know, they might, your, the unit managers might not even be aware that that kind of charging is occurring. So just make sure that, you know, you should be able to pull this from SQL pretty regularly. Um, and if not, your SIP coordinator will probably help you figure out what your actual charges are. And with TAMs, that should be more up to date than it's ever been. Um, but it's just have the discussion and, you know, make sure like, hey, we're pretty tight on this one. Let's yep. chill on the project yep. charges, right? Yeah. Yep. So I have one suggestion. It doesn't work for all situations, but I find that um, our, pro our budgets get start to dwindle quite a bit when we're working on one complicated issue, like maybe an archaeology site, and the rest of the team just continues to charge to it. And I will put a, a stop on charging for a month and a half or so and say only Teresa and Paul can charge to this for the next month and a half. Um, you know, talking that over with the area manager and letting the unit managers know what's going on as well. But yeah, when you've got an open EA and you know, people are going to charge to it, so I, I actually like send out an email to say, no one can charge on this except for these people for the next few months. So. Well, I can appreciate that after the fact. Um, have you ever tried getting a commitment from the unit managers on what they can deliver for a defined budget going into the project? I've tried. I, th I think it's also important to communicate our schedules. Um, our, our milestone schedules consist of a host of their deliverable dates. Um, it's important that we enforce and stick to those as best we can. Have, have you ever considered putting the tech center under contract? <laughs> so, so you're talking to the wrong guy because I actually, as a RECP, report to the tech center unit manager. Um, <laughs> so it, it does put me in an interesting position and I totally understand. Um, I, I think it's, it's all about communication with the unit managers and getting buy-in between the unit managers, the tech center manager, and the area managers to make sure we're all on the same page with their schedules and when things start to go sideways, we talk about it and understand why. It, it's, it's a crucial conversation yeah. that we need to have um, with folks. And especially if you've got a project that really is limited in, in budget and a big paving project, you know, which and then suddenly there's ramps, and suddenly there's this, right? So, um, again, there's no easy answer, um, but to have that communication and have that interaction and help folks understand, you know, this isn't, you know, a faucet that we just turned on. You can just keep running a bucket up to it every month, right? So, Have you had support from those unit managers and the tech center managers when the region manager has to go to the OTC for more money? We can always get better at communication. I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what he said. I, I think that's that's where I'll leave that one. Yeah. But yeah, we can we yeah. can always communicate better, and we're actually in Region Four actively working to improve that. Yeah. Um, because it's been a problem here recently for us. I I one of Bill's projects in particular where I'm managing the ADA contract. You know, we that that budget's gone for roadway, um, and so we're we're working to figure that out. But it's something that we should have seen coming or caught ahead of time. 
you know, it's, we want to be proactive about it and not reactive. And, and, you know, and I understand uh, that, that may be the negative, but the good part too is because ODOT folks aren't under contract, they're very flexible. So often when we got stuff that is very fuzzy and we don't have a good handle on it, that is often a good opportunity to have ODOT keep it in house because there, we don't know exactly what it's gonna require and it's hard to write a contract for that. Right? You must do this, you shout it as well. We don't know yet, we're just, you know, there's just too fuzzy. Um, and that's often an opportunity to allow us to use, uh, you know, folks in house. So, it, it, again, there's negative and positive of everything. Uh, with, with consultant contracts, I'm facing this right now, um, where I'm redoing, an, uh, I'm doing an amendment for a consultant contract, and it's very precise and all this stuff. Well, the, the project is broken up three pieces, we're gonna go fix price. There's all these different things happening, and it's just, it was just a pile of, of spaghetti noodles, right? And trying to undo that because you know I had to get very proscriptive on what they shall do, and so again it's 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 that communication it's it's working to figure out what's the best uh, resource to deliver a project. So I know it doesn't answer your question really, but it's it is what it is, and we we we'll, we'll work for it through it. Okay, thanks. Um, invoice tracking and, and then the project wise a team distribution list again project wise is your next best friend. Um, you can keep stuff in ProjectWise and utilize and that. Having, having that distribution list in ProjectWise is also really important. Um, yes. Staff changes, yep. uh, roles change, it happens really regularly. Uh, making sure that there's one source of truth for that, so anyone on the project can ask the project team something. You as a PL have whatever the most up-to-date resource is um, right then and there, so. Project-wise, uh, workflow at the end of project initiation. So, um, so now you've you've kicked off the project. What do you what do you do? So, that, um, as starting July 2019, a new project will have this folder, and the new folder is a project initiation folder. And it's it you're going to be required to have those things in that folder. Um, project let dates are required to be scheduled with the project control office, like we've discussed before. Uh, and the baselining to complete this. And, and that workflow is also available um, yeah. on the project delivery website. Um, and it really just tells you like, you know, hey, like you as, again, you need to have uploaded your charter, your ZM, zero CMR, get right. that all signed off on. And that's a cue to kick off the process with PCO, get them started. And that really effectively locks down and baselines your schedule, your scope, and your budget. And any deviations from that, and then when you start having to go through a CMR process and even a stip amendment. Okay. So I um, just want to provide, again, kind of a summary. Uh, we're almost done um, of where we're at. So what are the actual deliverables? Programming request, DA, project charter. Um, and again, this must match the baseline MS project schedule, so the charter and the schedule and the cost estimate, all those need to match. Um, and this is where the, the region's uh, sign-off occurs, the phase gate. MS project schedule, that's baseline. Your, your zero CMR, that's baseline. Funding IGA, if you need it, again, these are the things you've got to have done. Resources, sign the resources, consultant, in-house, make sure of both. Survey. Updo updated work zone decision tree, they talked about that in scoping. I didn't really uh, mention it here because it's, again, one of those things you've got to have done. Um, but you want to have an updated work zone decision tree, environmental scoping report, make sure that's done, updated risk log, uh, executed consultant work order contract, notice to proceed. One of the things I'll add to that is make sure you have your BOC. Um, that can sometimes get lost. It's not actually attached to the work order contract or your, your contract, but make sure you have that. That's what everything's kind of based off of moving forward. Yeah. That should go in your uh, project wise L3 folder. Um, that, you know, make sure that's something that's only you and area managers and others who have the right permissions to be able to see that, especially with the unified folder structure. You don't want uh, consultants, you know, um, even though they, even though they saw it, it's just that it's the appropriate place for that is the L3 folder. Um, there's a whole discussion about that too on uh, the right folder placement of different things. Um, I know with, uh, with OPO, they have their own database where they manage their contracts and then we have our own share folders, and then there's project wise, so there's, you know, contract can be three different places. Um, we're all working on that, trying to get it better. And 
and the project team kickoff meeting, that's really the last thing. That's when you get everyone in a room and you're able to have that opportunity to talk about the why, why you're here, what the project is, uh, the goals and objectives, and what's next. Questions and comments? So as Scott is working his way over there, just we have, um, and we purposely did a lot of time for questions or comments, and we, as we've noticed your comments from the survey, that um, this is your opportunity to do a deeper dive, ask those questions, um, how to do things. So go for it. What was the source of info on the last slide? That one? Yeah. The source of info? Yeah. The source. Well, those are those things that are required. Or, yeah, those are the things required or things you want to have done. Um, if you go, oh, okay, I know what you're asking for is where is the link, where do I find that stuff? That's a good question. I think maybe we can get that out to folks. Um, that's a, a good reminder is that all of these PowerPoint presentations are in PDF format with the exception of like yesterday's Vidali put in an extra slide. Those are on the project delivery portal. All of these are on that SharePoint site. So all you have to do is select the folder and this stuff will be in there. So go ahead with the other question. Well, Oscar is gonna oh. respond to that. No, I was just about to address his question. Um, these deliverables are on the portal, so you can go there at every yeah. phase, project delivery phase, you'll see what are the required deliverables. The portal will have all that information. Yeah. Okay, I think, I don't know who was first, so I'll have you guys battle it out. So you mentioned the project charter and the Microsoft schedule needs to match. At what point do you have to do a CMR that your schedule changes? Well, in project initiation? Well, your, your schedule's gonna change. The question is by how much in your Microsoft project schedule right. changes that you have to do a CMR to update your charter or the or the earlier version of the CMR. So at this point in the process, you know, you're doing a zero, zero, set, yeah, zero CMR to baseline that. Um, that said, moving forward, um, you should have like guidelines uh, either in your region or for the CMR process that tell you what constitutes a formal change. That's something we're working on defining better in region four. Um, you know, it's, it's been part of our process, but uh, for us, like anything that, that requires maybe a step change, or um, you know, delivery year change, that's something that's- Or the would, PDII milestone. Right, or change it into a milestone, that's something that would require CMR. Yeah. Um, usually stuff under that is stuff that you can work out within your region. Um, like preliminary plans, milestone, and those, those ones. And there's gonna be, I know they're gonna talk about that this afternoon, but um, you know, look to your internal um, process in your region how to do that. Um, but again, this is, this is the opportunity to get it right. I guess that's, you know, you can almost think, well, I'm being penalized or whatever. You know, I get this. I, get, I didn't scope this, and I got this thing. It's your opportunity to get it right. It's your opportunity to get the scope right, the budget right, the schedule right. Uh, so instead of looking at it as, well, you know, look what's being done to me. <laughs> look at us opportunity of what, how can I get this right? So as we move forward, I've got the right schedule, I've got the right uh, budget, I've got the right scope, and I can be more successful in accomplishing that. Does that make sense? No, go ahead. I, I noticed that in your earlier slide you touched upon performance measures. Um, yes. Other than scope, schedule, and budget, is there anything that you do within your project teams to measure performance? Mm. Yeah, so. In, again, in Region 4, we have um, a whole spreadsheet of our internal key performance measures, and those are ones that are worked out between essentially our region manager, area managers, tech center unit managers, tech center manager. Um, the whole group of our management team puts that together. Um, so we have certain things that are relevant to this, like um, making sure that we're getting comments from our resident engineers during our different stages that we're, um, our designers, our tech center units are actually visiting the projects and seeing what they design how that's looking. So we, we have a whole spreadsheet of internal performance measures. I think that's really just an opportunity for you to implement those within your region as well. Um, I have a question about what information is 
okay and appropriate to share with consultants prior to that, to working on that RFP. Oh. So I have a lot of consultants that are um, asking for information and I'm being new, hesitant to like, how do I know what's <laughs> okay? Do I share the scoping notes, um, the scoping estimate, things like that? Like so what is okay, what is not? So the best thing to do is to ask OPO first. Yes. So whoever your OPO rep is, make sure you talk to them and make sure they understand the request. Um, so you don't put yourself in a situation where you can't procure what you need to later. Um, and then also, like just a good rule of thumb is to make sure you're consistent. Yeah. consistent. Yeah. So if you're gonna make something available to one person, it probably needs to be available to everyone else. Um, and so again, that's where that coordination with your OPO person is really important. Um, if you have shared information, um, it, it might behoove you to put that out there. So it's not just one company that has it. Um, Oddly enough, oftentimes some of these companies would have helped in scoping, right? So they might have it already, and that's a leg up for them uh, if they're not yep. conflicted. And I had that situation where uh, the person got HDR works on it. Well, they did um, some work for the ADA program on ramps on Greenwood Street. So they had a leg up already on, on, on the work effort. So I had to make sure that everything that they produced and they knew was basically on, on a website and available to all, all other consultants bidding on the project. So I would definitely encourage you, as Omar said, to talk to your OPO representative um, specialist because it, <laughs> it can really delay your project because you can go have an RFP and then have, have it contested and then you're going to start over. So And once, once your procurement yeah. started, there should be zero communication yeah. between you and any consultants. Yeah, but what can you share before then? That, again, talk to your per, uh, procurement specialist. That's the best thing to do. So. So could you go back a slide? Back a slide. Yep. Is this supposed to be a sequence of events? No. So, oh, okay. Just a list. No, so just a list. So your charter would have team input prior yep. to having yep. it completed in base yep. I just tried to summarize okay. you know, all the things that have to be done, right? Whether it's you do them or doing them or someone else, all the things that have to be done uh, for project initiation. So it's not sequential. I didn't mean to make that sequential. Okay, thank you. Uh, this goes back to your communication efforts probably with your tech center, but when you are trying to decide are you going to go through the tech center or consult it out, mm -hmm. um, are they giving you a good idea of what their capacity is at the time when you make that commitment and you're, you're seeing that? And then yeah. how do you handle changes if that capacity changes, it's impacting your project by their resources? How do you handle that? Well, I can tell you a little bit from my perspective. I'll let someone who works with the tech center jump in. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we do resource leveling. I mean, we have this in, uh, spreadsheet in a region for when we look at performance measures, and we're able to look at in the future and see when you know certain milestones are coming out, especially uh, PSNE and that kind of thing, when there's a, you know it's a major load. And then based on that, we can make decisions about, okay, we know that you know, these folks are gonna be pretty occupied for these months. We can't, we can't change the schedule. It has to be obligated within that federal fiscal year. We need to look at uh, outsourcing other projects to relieve that workload. So it's that workload balancing effort. The, the key there, is too, is to make sure that we're not making outsourcing decisions kind of at the last minute, yes. whether that's outsourcing a project or bringing it back in, because it really just messes up the flow on the outside. So we wanna make sure that if we know we're gonna outsource something, we, we figure that out as early as possible and we try to stick to it. Yeah. Um, and same for the opposite scenario. Yeah, yeah. This is maybe a follow-up question to his question, which I thought was a very good one. Um, does Region 4 look at utilization rates of the units in terms of uh, availability or how many man hours you might get uh, per month or uh, over time to get a sense of um, you know, kind of an earned value type look. Um, just so we, yeah. we're not that mature yet. Um, I wish we were. Uh, coming from a project controls background as well, like I wish we did earn value. We're not quite there yet. Um, before I got involved in one of my other projects, I was working with the roadway uh, manager to figure out how we could start implementing that. Um, we already, <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> we already have Microsoft Project, um, which can track resources, right? And we can set hours. So. It'd be great to be able to use it for that. Um, it's quite an exercise to set it up. So right now, we, our unit managers have like spreadsheets. You know, it's kind of ad hoc, looking at teams, 
and I guess they have design pods. Um, you know, just making sure that they're able to do that, but we, we definitely could be more mature with that. Yeah. Good question. Other questions or questions comments? Or comments? If I have a project that kicked off and was put into ProjectWise prior to <laughs> July, do I need to request the project initiation folder? So was, was it already initiated? It's, yeah, it's already in ProjectWise. I'm coming up on project initiation in like two weeks, so I need a place to drop that CMR zero. Do I need to request a folder? Or do I put it in project management? Where do I file that? Oscar? Yes, you need to, because you have to go through the new phase gate. Uh, and part of, of that phase gate, you have to go through an automated process flow within ProjectWise. So you need to have that folder. <coughs> yep, 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 yep. Okay. Thanks. But if your project was already, you know, past um, project initiation phase, you do not need that folder. So that's just the key. And this afternoon we're going to talk about DAP. Those are two differences. When your project is going through project initiation phase, then you need that new folder. In the afternoon today, when we were talking about DAP, same thing. We just, uh, we have just implemented the workflow in ProjectWise for the DAP phase gate, so there's a timeline for that. Not every project will be required to go through that phase within ProjectWise. So we can clarify this afternoon, but for the uh, project is initiation phase, as long as your project is new and you're going through that phase, you have to have that folder to support the workflow in ProjectWise, because all your signatures and your files and PCO, Michelle is expecting to see your files in ProjectWise within that folder. And, um, I know we did not get into the details today here as we were covering that slide, talking about project-wise workflow, but there's more materials at your own time you can read, and if you have any questions, just reach out to me or project-wise team. They should be able to explain to you on how you go through the process, because that's key. You have to, like Mike was saying, you have to set up your uh, bidlet date, then baseline your project, then we can capture that and say your project initiation phase is complete. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So when you uh, baseline your, let's say you do your zero CMR, and the guidance on that is that if a schedule changes, doesn't affect the downstream dates, you don't have to submit another CMR. But once it's baseline, let's say you change a date that doesn't affect downstream, do we have to let anybody know on that baseline? What schedule change? What, what do you change? Well, let's say you change DAP, but it doesn't affect your row or your PSNE or your bidlet. So the, on the CMR guidance, it says if it doesn't affect downstream, you don't have to submit another CMR. But do we have to contact anybody for, to let them know that we changed the DAP for the baseline? I haven't run into that. I haven't run into so, that either. Yeah. Uh, slip and dap, and you're not going to affect right away. Uh, well, I'm that just an example, whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's, just, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's that's the guidance. So I'm just yeah. curious: do we, if if we could, if we can change a date without affecting the downstream, we don't have to submit the CMR. Do we have to let anybody that's baselined it? That's more of my question: is does once it's baselined, what's our requirements there? Well, what's your internal process? I mean, what does your region say about that? I guess I would defer to. I would go back to them. That's a good question. I, I don't know. That's uh, haven't had experience. Yeah. But. So just to clarify, any time you yeah. change your baseline, we will have to, to have a discussion. You may have to, con you will have to contact PCO because we go through that process again. Yeah. If you change this afternoon again, we're going to talk about that phase gate and what, in, what needs to happen at the end of that phase gate. You will have to let PCO know, then the PCO office will let our scheduling administrator know that the schedule baseline has been modified so that we can capture that. Because we have to keep that baseline for performance <coughs> reporting at the end of projects. And, and kind of to that point, I want to make sure we're using the same terms here. Um, because a baseline is just that. It really shouldn't be changed unless there's a key scope or schedule or something, like a key scope change to the project. You really shouldn't be changing the baseline. So if you're going to miss a date for some reason, that's it's okay. Things happen, but you shouldn't rebaseline just for, just because the date's going to be different. And um, we will soon be establishing criteria for rebaselining or resetting baselines. So let's say, like Mike was explaining, avoidable, unanticipated, elective. Depending on what type of change you're making, if it's an elective, then we say, okay, fine, we decided because it's a good decision. 
then very likely we'll be able to reset that baseline. And resetting meaning we're going to capture a new baseline that we can use for, for, for performance reporting. But we'll still have that initial data point of what it was before you decided to reset that baseline. So there will be some criteria that we will use to say, yes, now we can reset the baseline. Or the most of the cases, if we have an avoidable change, we won't be resetting baselines. We just leave it the way it is. And then when it comes to reporting, the red will be red, green will be green, yellow will be yellow. We've had that dis this discussion like three weeks ago. We had a discussion with area managers, and we'll have a follow-up discussion in like a week or two with area managers again, just clarifying these criteria in the process. Had a question regarding the uh, third-party access into ProjectWise. I know uh, initially I heard the explanation of what the project manager had to do as far as the uh, security documents and how frequently they had to be updated. And to be honest, my need was low at the time, so I skipped the whole part and just didn't have them accessing ProjectWise. So with that, um, and it's had time to mature some. Are, has it been refined? Are you spending a lot of time with that? Um, I had, it seems like at the time, it was like every couple of weeks you had to renew security access for all kinds of individuals. Um, I'd, I'd have to go back and check the dates, um, but I'm pretty sure, like at least for the ones I've encountered, it's been like a year. Okay. Um, now the access process, that can take anywhere from like three to 10 business days. It just depends on where they are and what the security folks have going on. Um, but but most, most renewals shouldn't be less than a year. Okay, so it sounds like it's been extended some from the initial yeah. Yeah. discussions. Yeah. yeah, process is a lot more streamlined. I mean, it's... Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. When we talk about baselining the schedule, just the schedule, are we talking about the date DAP is due, and, or the date DAP is complete, and the date a ps &E, or are there other things that are being baselined and registered and captured and reviewed? And So yes um, is the best answer to that. Uh, and if you look at our, but yeah, so we, I think we have nine or 10 um, actual milestones that are gonna be tracked uh, moving forward that are critical for, for the baseline, um, so to speak. So it's not just DAP and ps &E, although those are probably the ones that we're most worry, worried about as um, you know, PMs, but uh, there's, there's a host of other ones like opening uh, the right-of-way EA, opening PEA, kickoff, um, and then <clears throat> forecasted for a second, third notes, stuff like that. So it, it goes beyond DAP and PSD. I guess what I'm saying. And just to clarify, the only time we baseline a schedule is, that, is at the end of project initiation phase. When we get to DAP, like I said, we're going to be talking about it this afternoon. When you get to DAP, that is not, that is not going to be your baseline. We're just going to capture a snapshot of your schedule. But our initial point when we baseline is at the end of project initiation phase. So our reference point when it comes to performance reporting, saying a project was late, when you get to PSNE or when we're looking at first note, second note, all that stuff, the reference point is gonna be your baseline at the end of project initiation phase, whatever was captured during that time. But at the end of DAP, PSNE, we're just gonna be capturing snapshot to compare between the two points. Because again, the purpose of capturing or performance reporting is process improvement. We're trying to figure out where do we have issues. So We'll capture that one at the end of project initiation, at the end of DAP, at PSNE, and as we report performance, we'll be looking at where we have delays, where we have issues, we can figure out and narrow down into specific root causes and at the end of the day, process improve. Because at the end of the day, that's the purpose of performance reporting. It's not reporting to capture who is slacking and all that stuff, it's just to improve. Yep. Okay, thank you. Other questions? One more here. You mentioned that in your region you have someone now helping you with invoice tracking. Yes. How long did that take you to get your region to buy into that? <laughs> and, and, and any tips for those of us who want to try to convince our region to also have someone assist us with invoice tracking? Yeah, well, um, that is actually a, a position. It's a new hire, and um, she's been with us a year and a half, maybe. Um, but not just that, but agreements, coordinator, invoice coordinator. I mean, uh, 
because we really saw some lacks in our ability to effectively um, and to, to track things and to review the invoices appropriately. And we've been audited recently and there were some glaring uh, issues with how we review and approve invoices. Um, and so we've set some controls in place and some things in place to do a better job of documenting that. But as far as uh, how do we get, uh, promote that, that's strategy like everything else, right? It's, it's, it's a need, and, um, but we had a real need in the region to find someone who could really kind of be that point coordinator of agreements and invoicing and then other things as they come up, so. She, um, is, is her checklist like statewide or is that something that she and Dakota put together? So she has like an invoice review checklist yeah. that's been really yeah. helpful that, yeah. you know, um, it's still a lot of work to go through and she helps us yep. do that now, yep. but you know, that, that's step one, right? So just having something to be able to run through for every invoice you get. Uh, I think region one has an invoice person as well and she's incredibly thorough, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can use those as examples. Quick question. Um, I know in initiation, you're drafting up your statement of work for outsourcing. Uh, when and how do you determine which type of payment method in your work order contract? Um, time and material, uh, cost plus fixed fee, um, fixed price? So I think, I don't wanna speak for Mike, but I think we both prefer any sort of lump sum delivery method, but um, not, not every problem, um, I guess that's not a solution for every problem. Um, that works when you have a pretty known deliverable and you, a known time and cost, but there's, there's gonna be items that you're gonna wanna have time and materials to be able to track better, you know, this is getting a little out of hand or a little more work than we thought. And on a lump sum style payment method, um, you're not gonna be able to accommodate that as well for the consultant. So you really kinda wanna pick and choose. Um, in my opinion, we should be delivering more things with a lump sum method rather than time materials, but time materials tends to be what folks are comfortable with because that's what they've been doing for so long. Um, I would agree with that. Um, I can, I, I like fixed price, um, but there's instances where a project has too many squishy elements and there's too many risks, and when I'm trying to write the scope of work, I'm realizing, I don't know, I don't know where this is going, I don't know what all the risks are, we don't, we don't know how, how much, so at that point, that's when you have discussion with a consultant, like, you know, I'm thinking this might be these, these first few phases, let's just make this TNM till we figure some of this out. Because it lowers their risk, I'm gonna get better work out of them, as opposed to trying to cram a fixed price on it with a, with a known amount they're gonna get paid, and they're gonna be worrying about, well, how much work really are we gonna, you know, spend an effort in doing that, so. So it kinda depends. That's a good discussion to have again with your OPO uh, contract specialist and some other folks. I just want to let you know that on the CSU webpage, there is an invoice checklist okay, that you all can it. get, and it's dynamic where it fluctuates with the payment methodology you're using. Okay, perfect. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Oh, one more. Oh, one Question more. over here. Are you going to get that? Okay. <clears throat> I like that you used uh, the bricklayer analogy. I thought it was quite insightful. Um, I've also heard other people use um, herding cats. So as project managers, we've got all these people that we need to lead and manage. And you spoke to the point that the why, getting other people to see the why is important. Um, in your experience, um, how do you get um, a team at the initiation stage to see that why, how do you motivate your team? That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the harder part of what we do, is getting people that have a lot on their plate. You're not the only project they're working on most of the time. Um, <clears throat> and how do we get them to um, buy in on this project and deliver you know, 100%? Uh, with all the conflicts that they have going on. Um, it, it's an ongoing process. Um, I think uh, a lot of it starts with you uh, understanding that I'm just not here, um, you know, filling out forms and checklists, but you know, I'm the leader of this. I'm, I'm gonna be driving this forward. Sometimes you gotta put your shoulder down and push hard. Uh, that's what you gotta do. Um, 
as project uh, managers uh, in, in ODOT for the project delivery process, you know, we have very limited authority, it appears. Um, you know, we're responsible for scope, schedule, budget, but we don't really have any boxes under us, right? That we, but we do have an assumed authority, and you want to be able to use that. Uh, there is an assumed authority that you have when you run your project team meetings, you know, from everything, how prepared you are, um, your, your positioning, your expectations, communication of the vision, vision communication of wh what this project is going. Those are things that uh, help you um, manage the project and manage the people, because in fact, that's what you're doing. You're managing people and managing those expectations. So that's a whole, I think, another discussion. We could have probably a day or two just talking about that, um, because you are working with people, not just things. Um, and we got to get to plans and specs, right? We got to get something built. Um, but to convey that in, in, your, in all your meetings and all your interactions in a professional way, but also in a way that you know, helps them understand that you have an assumed authority in this project. So. Kind of as a compliment or supplement to that as well, like one of my projects right now is a big exercise in cheerleading, really, for me. Um, and so it's, it's important um, for me to, like if you're lucky, the person might live in the community and they know that they're helping that thing, right? Like we as public servants, like. That should be our motivation. Um, but yeah, like also making sure that we can align, you know, that person's specific interests and goals with the project's interests and goals, and then get by in that way. And you're gonna have to talk to that person, really understand that person, build a relationship with them to understand what their goals might be. Um, so for the projects I've inherited, which are all of them, um, I've had to build those relationships and understand what those goals are so I can reframe those in the goals of the project and make sure that everyone's moving the same way. Big round of applause Thank for you. Mike and Ahmed.